Hello, everyone. I'm Joan Kerr, and this is World Canvas Studio, a production of International Programs, co-sponsored today by Prairie Lights Books. UITV is recording the program for later broadcast, and an audio file of the program will be found at the Public Radio Exchange, which is prx.org. As we begin, I'd like to extend a special thank you to our hosts here at the Iowa City Congregational Church. We have the distinct pleasure today of spending some time with Eliza Griswold, the author of The Tenth Parallel, Dispatches from the Fault Line Between Christianity and Islam, and with two distinguished members of the faculty of the University of Iowa, Jeff Cox of the Department of History and Michael Chibnick of the Department of Anthropology. First, Ms. Griswold will read from her book, The Tenth Parallel, and then we'll move into a conversation where all three of our guests will discuss themes from the book. From the moment of its publication earlier this year, the 10th parallel, Dispatches from the Fault Line Between Christianity and Islam, has drawn intense attention. It's been reviewed everywhere, it seems, and has struck a real chord with readers around the world who are looking for answers to some of the toughest questions afflicting our times. Questions about religion, ethnicity, violence, nationhood, power, and natural resources. In her book, Eliza Griswold, or should I say the fearless Eliza Griswold, takes us on a journey around the globe at the 10th parallel, a line of latitude 700 miles north of the equator, which is, she claims, a geographical and ideological front line where Christianity and Islam collide. For seven years, she traveled through Nigeria, the Sudan, Somalia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines, reporting on events, recording her observations, and collecting stories. And whether the stories tell of heart-wrenching personal tragedies or dislocation and loss of culture, they're beautifully told by a clear-eyed, experienced journalist and a respectful author. Eliza Griswold is a fellow at the New American Foundation. She received a 2010 Rome Prize from the American Academy in Rome. Her journalism has appeared in The Atlantic, The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and many other publications. A 2007 Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, she was awarded the first Robert I. Friedman Award for investigative reporting. A collection of her poems, Wide Awake Field, was published in 2007. Please welcome our guest, Eliza Griswold. Thanks, Joan, so much. And thank you all for coming. I I want to give a special shout out to my friend Sarah, who's sitting in the front row, because without her tenacity, I would not be here this evening. In fact, I wouldn't be in Iowa City at all. So I'm very grateful to her. So this book is the culmination of seven years. Oh, it sounds like God. <laughs> How is that clear enough? OK. Uh, please tell me if I start to echo. Just to be clear does not sound like God, nor do I think I don't have that brand of megalomania, so we're all right here. But so this book is the culmination of seven years of traveling along a particular frontier where Christianity and Islam meet. And just a, a bit of geography before I begin. Uh, latitude, I remember from Sarah and my, my school in Chicago, Lat is flat, latitude is horizontal, so we'll begin there. So here is the equator. The 10th parallel is the line of latitude 700 miles to the north of that line. So I spent seven years traveling within this band from about, over about 9,000 miles from West Africa through Southeast Asia. And I traveled in Nigeria, Sudan, Somalia and Ethiopia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And I went to these places because we'll start with the, the, the demographics were extremely powerful to me. And four out of five of the world's 1.3 billion Muslims aren't Arabs and they don't live in the Middle East. They're Africans and they're Asians. And I wanted to go to see what happened when this population met about a little less than half of the world's two billion Christians. I wanted to go two floods, two droughts, two mega slums. I wanted to go to, in Indonesia, Christians and Muslims have come to blows over, over crops of chocolate. And I wanted to go to see, because when global cacao prices spiked, so did violence between Christians and Muslims because they were trying to own these particular crops. 
So I wanted to see what happened across cultures and continents when these two religions actually met. We've heard so much of this oversimplified and overblown clash of civilizations narrative. And so I wanted to go investigate what happened on the ground. This trip began in 2003 with, with a voyage to Sudan with Franklin Graham, who is Billy Graham's son and the head of about a half billion dollar evangelical empire. And Franklin was at the time the personal pastor to George W. Bush. And Franklin was going to meet with a man he had called just as evil as Saddam Hussein. And that is President Bashir, who is still the president of Sudan today. And Bashir had waged, he waged the modern world's most violent jihad against Christians and Muslims alike in his own country. And it was here in Sudan that Franklin Graham's vision of Islam be began. And, and Franklin Graham had, at this time in 2003, he had called Islam a very wicked and evil religion. So for him to be traveling to a, a Muslim land, uh, having said these things, was extremely controversial. It was controversial especially for the, for the Muslims who lived in Sudan. But it wasn't controversial for the President Bashir, who actually has since been indicted for war crimes for his actions in Darfur. Bashir wanted Graham to come because he wanted to say to the West, don't bomb us. He did not want, after Afghanistan and Iraq, to become the third rogue Muslim regime on the American hit list. And then there was no better way to do that than to make friends with the powerful evangelical forces that were close to President Bush. So when this historic meeting was going to happen, I thought, you know, I want to go along. And so I asked Graham if I could do so, and he said yes. And so I went and sat in this marble palace as these two men met and spoke. And at first what happened is they largely tried to convert one another and that did not go very well. And so then what happened was quite interesting because Franklin Graham, as a legacy of more than 100 years of, of colonial rule and, and a lack of infrastructure in, in southern Sudan, Franklin Graham runs the South's largest hospital in a place called Louis. And one of the reasons he hates Bashir so is that President Bashir has tried to bomb that hospital a couple of times. And so Graham was talking about his, he was talking about his hospital and he said, Mr. President, I have a hospital in the South. And Graham and Bashir, who speaks fluent English, was just listening and he was responding in Arabic. He said one thing in English during this interview, which is when Graham turned to him and said, I know that I have a hospital at Louis in the South, Bashir turned to him and said, isn't that the hospital we bombed? And, and Graham responded twice and you missed. So at this point in the conversation, I was ushered out along with many of the other dignitaries so these men could continue the conversation in private. And as Graham told me later, he remembered at this moment that he had in his, the pocket of his blue blazer, he had a George W. Bush 2004 re-election pin, which he'd taken from the desk of Karl Rove's secretary. So he reached into his pocket and he handed the pin to President Bashir and he said, Mr. President, I understand you'll be speaking to my president later today on the phone. Why don't you tell him you're his first voter here in the Sudan? So what is that encounter about? That encounter is really a way in which Franklin Graham took a role in American foreign policy, a, a role that we don't see very often, and this is how faith and foreign policy become intertwined, which for me is an incredibly fascinating subject. So beginning with that, in Sudan that trip, I learned that the British had divided Sudan on the 10th parallel in 1904 because they had already faced a massive Islamic rebellion and been very publicly shamed and withdrawn from the country, come back and, and defeated the Sudanese. And in 1904, they did not want Christian missionaries stirring up any more trouble with Muslims in the north of the country. So they drew a line across the 10th parallel and they said, missionaries, you go to the south. Go to the non-Muslim people, but you will not be working among Muslims anytime soon. The legacy of that divide is more than 40 years of civil war and the death of about 2 million people. 
So learning these statistics as I traveled with Graham, I realized that this line didn't simply stretch across Sudan, Africa's largest country, but across most of inland Africa. And so I continued on the journey. But I'm going to read to you what happened after, after Franklin Graham had this meeting with Bashir. We went back to the government guest house, and the irony of that was quite heavy, that, that here Graham was staying as a guest paid for by the very government that had spent sometimes up to $2 million a day waging war against its own people. So that was a difficult stay. And Franklin Graham invited many Sudanese Christian leaders over to this guest house to pray with them for Sudan. And I was standing there with my notebook. I was there as a journalist. and. I must have lowered my head without thinking about it. Uh, and so afterwards, that provoked a question from Graham's second in command, a man named Ken Isaacs, about what, where I came from and what my faith was. So I'm going to read to you a little bit of that background because what I've learned, for me, we've all watched the death of objectivity in the news that we read every day. We've, we've watched, you know, people on the left and right begin to speak for as if they're telling us the news when really they're telling us their opinions. And so in, in writing this book, the best I could do was to own my own subjectivity, to own where I came from, and to bring back the stories of those who live along this fault line in both peaceful coexistence and in conflict with one another, to bring those voices back whole cloth and let people speak for themselves. So here's what happened with Franklin Graham. In, a, in the hallway, a few moments after the prayer meeting, Ken Isaacs, Graham's second-in-command, a tall, hard-jawed North Carolinian who would go on to head the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance under President Bush, approached me and asked, what's your background? Originally, I came from Philadelphia, I told him. That's not what I meant, he said. Was I a believer or not? Salvation was absolute. Saved or damned, there was no in-between. Which was I? To me, the question required a more complex answer. I was raised as the daughter of an Episcopal priest and grew up in a rectory in suburban Philadelphia during the 70s and 80s, a particularly progressive moment for the church. Worship included Passover seders, Jesus Christ superstar, and doing the crop hunger walk, as well as gathering around an altar and eating homemade organic wheat bread as the Eucharist. This was the bustling, clamorous world of public religion. Talking and listening to God involved a quiet conversation and words I was sure were the way to reach his ear. For me as a six-year-old girl, going out to play often meant sneaking next door to the dark, cool church. I learned to read by standing at the pulpit and practicing the Bible's cadences out over the empty pews. I saw the Bible sitting open on the brass lectern, a red satin ribbon marking the page as a book of spells one whose extravagant metaphors, whose terrible and powerful parables were ways to call God to earth. In college, 15 years later, I read the work of the 20th century Romanian historian and theologian, Mercia Iliade. When I came across his concept of hierophany, the spaces where the sacred and secular worlds meet and people's attempt to create them through ceremony, I understood what I had been up to as a child. At Sunday school, a boy my age once asked if my father was God. No, he's God's best friend, I replied. I saw my loving, distant, distractible father caught between two worlds. One was a place of worldly decisions and unexpected telephone calls. Once I watched him rip the rectory's black rotary phone right off the wall. The other was a sacred realm in which he was a servant, not a leader. When I was 12, he was elected the Episcopal Bishop of Chicago. And so we moved from a Philadelphia suburb to the urban shore of Lake Michigan. At his consecration, the rite in which a person formally offers himself or herself to God as a bishop, my father, following long tradition, lay face down on the cathedral floor with his legs extended and his arms outstretched, his body forming the shape of a cross. There was something about this act of utter surrender that terrified and angered me. What right had God and the several thousand Midwestern strangers in the pews to demand my father's life? When are they going to let dad up, I asked my mother. Although I feared for my father, I also feared for myself. 
What did God want from us anyway? As a teenager, I grew petrified of God's will. What if he were to swoop down and ask me to submit also? What could faith cost me? It could cost me myself, I concluded. Frankly, I was afraid God would ask me to be a nun. My father's uncompromising commitment to the articles of his faith proved difficult for me to reconcile with his progressive values and his critical intelligence. I spent those years wondering how it was that faith and intellect went together. When I traveled with Franklin Graham to Sudan 16 years later, my father was serving as the presiding bishop. The consecration of Jean V. Robinson had just taken place, upsetting African bishops and also conservative American evangelicals such as Graham, with the blessing it obviously conferred on homosexuality. This was evidence to them of the lethal moral lassitude of the West, where, the whole, where whole churches were bent on denying God's will as revealed by scripture. For Graham, the contemporary confrontation with Islam was sharpening the Christian faith, giving it moral fortitude. Western sinfulness and moral slackness were weakening the faith worldwide, and Christianity needed the West to shape up if it was going to win the fight. But for Graham, as for others, the consecration of Jean Robinson as the Bishop of New Hampshire was not just a sign of weakness, a falling away from the old true faith. It was a full-on repudiation of sexual morality. As such, it marked a divide between Protestants worldwide over what it meant to be a Christian, over whether progressives or conservatives had the right to speak in the name of God. The Reverend Franklin Graham and Presiding Bishop Frank Griswold stood on opposite sides of this divide, and the gap between them was widening, and I was the Presiding Bishop's daughter. You have 30 seconds to tell Franklin, Isaac said. Graham was in the dining room, eating a lunch of oxtail soup with 12 members of his entourage. In the doorway, I hesitated. 13 seconds, Isaac said, standing behind me. I sat down and told Graham who my father was. Graham listened, then looked at me and flashed a smile. Not the familiar high-watt public beam, but a private and mischievous grin. He and I were kin, for although we were raised with very different understandings of what it meant to be a Christian, we were also fellow PKs, or preacher's kids, modeled sheep who had grown up caught between religious parents and private rebellion. But that's where our similarity ended. As far as he was concerned, the fact that I had not accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior meant I was going to hell. There's no middle ground. Salvation is black and white, Graham told me. He had made this choice for Christ himself. Why hadn't I? I asked him to clarify, what did he mean by praying to Jesus? How was that different from praying to God? The clatter of soup spoons ceased. Graham looked at me and said, Jesus is the only one who died for our sins. Muhammad didn't do that. Buddha died still searching for truth. He quoted what I later learned was the gospel according to John, chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There was only one way to be saved and to be assured a place in heaven, through faith in Jesus Christ. If your plane crashes tomorrow, he asked, are you absolutely sure you'll go to heaven? I thought for a minute, no. Would you be willing to pray with me now? That better have sold one book. That's it. <laughs> okay, so I think we're about, I think that's probably a good place to stop. And thank you so much for listening. Let me just say that that passage reveals the central message of the book which is the, the most important and overlooked religious clashes of our time are the confrontations inside of religions, not between them. It's the wrestles between conservatives and liberals or on the Islamic side, Sunnis, Shia, Sufi, over who has the right to speak for God and why. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Eliza. I'm going to introduce now our two uh, fellow panelists here, our conversation partners. At the far end is Jeff Cox, a Texan. Jeff Cox attended Rice University, where he spent the summer of 1968 as a Southern Baptist student missionary in Vietnam. After receiving his PhD from Harvard, he joined the history department at the University of Iowa, where he has regularly taught Western civilization and written three books. The first, The English Churches in a Secular Society, was a study of the decline of church-going in 20th century England. He then began research in India and Pakistan for a book on British and American missionary work under colonial rule, published in 2002 as Imperial Fault Lines, Christianity and Colonial Power in India, 1818 to 1940. In 2008, Jeff Cox published a comprehensive survey of British missionary work around the world, the British Missionary Enterprise since 1700. Last spring, he was a residential fellow at the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Study in Uppsala, Sweden, where he worked on a, worked on a book on secularization entitled European Religion, American Religion, Why the Difference? And sitting next to Jeff Cox is Michael Chibnick, professor of anthropology here at the University of Iowa. His research in Mexico, Peru, Belize, Guatemala, and the United States has examined household economics, political conflict, work organization, agricultural systems, and craft production. Mike is the author of Risky Rivers, The Economics and Politics of Floodplain Farming in Amazonia, and Crafting Tradition, The Making and Marketing of Oaxacan Wood Carvings. His next book, Anthropology, Economics, and Choice, will be published in the fall of 2011. Please welcome our new guests. Well, I'm just going to ask the first question, Eliza. Of course, it's a big one. Um, I'm so impressed by the research you've done, by the book you've written here, and I, and I find it completely compelling. But how, how do you, having put all this together, how do you begin to sort out where the problems really lie? Well, I, is this okay, or do we need a... Yeah, okay. So the, the principle truth that I found in, in each of these religious conflicts in Nigeria, Sudan, Somalia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines, where, where, where there had been skirmishes or, or full-blown violence, uh, is that everyone had a secular trigger, trigger of some kind, whether that was land, oil, as in Sudan, water, crops of chocolate, local elections. So the causes were intertwined. Now, my challenge was in part because I come from, I mean, who I usually write for, I write for a largely, you know, I, I write for magazines that are secular magazines, and I had an experience with editors since I started doing this work in 2000 of them saying, come on, doesn't all this religious stuff really just boil down to political economy? And no, it doesn't. So a lot of my effort was to restore the role of how people who lived this experience believed that religion was a factor in their war, in their fighting, and to bring those voices back again as they saw it, not as we saw it. It's not about, oh, it's just they have an election coming up, and that's certainly a factor, but that's not the only one. Uh, Mike and Jeff, let me turn to you. Do you have any initial thoughts about the book, so something you'd like to... Mike, yeah, sure. Um, well, one of the things that I was uh, sort of struck with is that when I received the materials for the book, it was immediately sort of phrased in this sort of class of civilizations kind of context. And, um, for example, there's a, a quote here, a blurb on the back from Lawrence Wright where he says... Eliza Griswold gives us a rare look at how complex and interwoven these two cultures actually are, or the two cultures presumably on the one hand are Islam, on the other hand, uh, Christianity. And it seems to me that the whole message of your book as I read it is actually um, is against this sort of uh, clash of civilization sort of narrative. And I wondered if you could just talk about that a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, um. I mean, it's a challenge, again, as, you know, everything within this book is a paradox, because that's the truth. Nothing is one thing or the other. So geographically, these two religions do meet in this space. There is no question that violence um, between them in many places is on the uptick. To see that 
Somebody asked me last night, well, how do you position yourself with Samuel Huntington, father of Clash of Civilizations narrative? These, these are spaces where he would call them Islam's bloody borders, right? <clears throat> My lived experience has been that that kind of binary division between us and them, saved and, and damned, um, uh, you know, black and white actually leads to violence. So really the principal task of this book is to allow for the reality of difference uh, what, at the same time looking where that difference really lies and primarily with these tensions inside religions which we don't pay enough attention to because frankly they're not sexy enough to do so, that. You know, they don't catch media attention. We want big story headline, and a lot of what's really shaping the future of religion are wrestles within these religions that are much quieter. I wonder if you could say something about, I, have, I found a quote here on page 11, in which you say, um, other identity consequently comes to the fore. Religion above everything, even race or ethnicity, becomes a means to safeguard individual and collective security in this world and the next one. And I wonder what you meant by religion in a case where one of the messages of your book seemed to be there are all sorts of different kinds mm -hmm. of religion, both within Christianity mm -hmm. and within Islam. Mm -hmm. So many of the places in this, along this fault line are places where the state has failed, right? I mean, these, whoops, yikes, that's okay. Um, nations began, thank you, we'll put it together later. Um, <laughs> nations began as lines drawn arbitrarily on colonial maps, right? Late at night, tired, you know, administrator, wanting the, I mean, Sudan's a perfect example. It was cobbled together in its current form because of the slave trade. Uh, Sudan, you know, this is where the Arab North and non-Muslim South met, and it, the name Sudan, Balada Sudan, means land of the blacks. This is an ancient, ancient space where these two, these two different kinds of identity met. So what I have seen, particularly along this fault line, uh, is especially in Africa, but also in Southeast Asia, is that Christianity for many ethnic minorities has become an umbrella identity, a form of liberation, and a way to fight back against really centuries of oppression at, in their understanding at the hands of Islam, quite literally slavery. Uh, so that religion on a local level Take Nigeria, for example. There's no functioning state. The state is rapacious at best. You're not going to get electricity or water from your local government, but you sure will get it from your local imam or your local pastor if you join this group. So religion comes to have a local identity, much more so. Ask a Nigerian if he or she is, is what, what, they are, what they are. The first answer is a religious, not a national identity. And so... On a global level, the way that plays out is quite interesting and actually I think calls for a larger level of restraint in our own speech because as a, one of my favorite Nigerian pastors says, when the West sneezes, Africa and Asia catch the cold. So when a cuckoo from Florida stands up and says he is going to burn Korans, people actually do die uh, in Kabul. You know, at least two people were killed in riots as, as a result of the, those comments. Or, you know, after the Danish cartoon riots, more people were killed in Nigeria than in any other country. So that is because there is a global component to religious identity that Christians in these communities frequently pay. They stand in for the West, although we don't perceive the West to be particularly Christian. Many people, and I'm sure we'll hear this from this a little bit more, and many people, you know, until very recently, humanitarian work was not a secular enterprise. It was carried out by missionaries, and people's understanding of the West was that the West was explicitly Christian, and that history is very prevalent, as is now images of, of soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan, as is, of course, the music of Britney Spears and other such cultural icons. We don't see Britney Spears as some symbol of the Christian West, but Indonesians do. Jeff, can you uh, um, bring something from your perspective as an historian and someone who's really kind of studied sure. uh, Christianity, at least in, in other major parts of the colonial world, um, uh, weigh in on, on this? Well, I, I, actually, I would like to 
say something about theology instead of history. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but, I, but, but first I would like to say is if you haven't read this book, uh, get your credit cards out because uh, you have a treat uh, in store for you. This is a, a beautifully written book. I mean, it, I don't know if it's the influence of the Episcopal liturgy or the New King James Bible or something, or maybe just uh, skilled writing. And, and it's also a, a book with, uh, it's, a kind, it's an exciting book. There, there's a certain kind of, I, I'm sort of reminded of the great uh, intrepid Victorian lady explorers like Mary <laughs> Kingsley and Isabella Byrd, who went places where they were in danger and just marched on through, you know. And so it, it's, and it's got a terrific eye for detail. Uh, I, I thought that was. But the, the you know, and, and it's, it's also, and Michael, uh, you've already talked about this, it, it walks a, a kind of fine line in between these massive generalizations on the one hand, that are just so tyrannical when we try to understand history. Things like modernization, uh, capitalism, fundamentalism, uh, secularization, uh, clashes of civilization, fault lines everywhere. And what these things do is that they, without anyone making, anyone making a decision to do it, they, they throw things out, that things get left out that, that really ought to be there. And, uh, and one of the things that, that I think is very much in this book uh, is, I mean, it, is a, a phenomenon that I call the invisibility of liberal Protestantism. I mean, liberal Protestantism is just absolutely invisible in modern culture. I mean, we're in a liberal Protestant church. A member of this church writes fine historical novels about liberal Protestantism, in Iowa, Marilyn Robinson. President Obama is a liberal Protestant, which is why so many people are clueless, especially journalists, in trying to talk about his uh, religious faith. And, uh, and, uh, and it seemed to me that, that liberal Protestants pop up all the time in this book. But they, they don't because we're, we, the great narrative is the rise of fundamentalism. Everybody's supposed to, Protestants are supposed to be either evangelical or Pentecostal or fundamentalist or, or something like that. But up come these liberal Protestants who don't have a place in the story. And one of them, I think, is the author uh, who, who goes around uh, interrogating people from a quite explicitly liberal Protestant point of view. Uh, and uh, uh, not just Franklin Graham, but, but other, other people as well. And, and you know, I... And liberal Protestantism is often really boils down to, to questions of ethics. I mean, it's not so much about what you believe as how you should behave. And, and I would just like to ask about the sort of ethical considerations that went into publishing a book of this kind. Because it, I mean, I'm not talking about protecting the names of the innocent, which you do, but, but even though there's an attempt to escape the grand narrative of, of the clash of civilizations, there's really no other way to talk about this mm -hmm. in some respects. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that means there are different ways to read this book. Yeah. You, can, you can read it as what you explicitly say you're trying to do, and that's how I read it, as, as an attempt, a kind of humanistic liberal attempt to undermine the clash of narratives. But there's uh, still the, 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 the parallel itself sort of reinforces the use of that literary device. And so I, you know, when I was uh, about to publish my book on missionaries in India, I I took uh, the title to some Indian Christian pastors that I knew, and I said, what about this pastor? And, you know, Indians are the most courteous people in the world. No one would ever be critical. <laughs> but they kind of shrank kind of in horror from me and said in the nicest possible way, please don't use the word imperialism in, in the title. It could put us in danger. Mm -hmm. and, but I had to use it because that's what I was writing about. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, I had to make a decision about whether to publish it in D India or the United States. Because in India, as you probably know, academic books are all reviewed as soon as they're mm -hmm. published in the daily newspapers, mm -hmm. all of them. And, uh, and I could just see some BJP politician waving mm -hmm. this book around and people getting killed mm -hmm. as a result of this book, which was sold 200 copies. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I just wonder if, if you thought about that, about the consequences mm -hmm. of it and, and how you, I'm, I'm, this is a long-winded question, mm -hmm. but how you, how you reasoned your way through to a decision mm -hmm. that you made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I love that question. So. I, I began reporting this book before, the, the first thing that I thought I was going to do after I traveled with Franklin Graham, I was, became intensely interested in this um, mission strategy that became popular during the late 90s called the 1040 window. And it was that there is, 
this is prim primarily an American idea, but it had support from all over the world. And okay, it, so it was started by a man named Luis Bush, who used to be a consultant at Arthur Anderson. He's a numbers cruncher. And he is a mission strategist, so he was very involved in shaping, and still is, how are people going to, where are the places on earth that the word, uh, the word, right, the Christian word still hasn't penetrated? Being a numbers guy, he took this question, and he took the question, of where, I'm just going to use his language, he said, where are the spiritually poorest of the poor, and where are the literal poorest of the poor, meaning those who make less than $500 a year, where do they live? He took, the, those, he took UN statistics and gave them to a satellite mapping company, um, Global Information Systems in California. And when these guys crunched the numbers on satellite images of the world, they came up with, remember, these are not his statistics, these are UN statistics, this region called the, that he and his wife started to call the 1040 window. Why? Because it lies between that line of latitude, the 10th parallel and the 40th, which in our country is New Jersey, but, but it is Southern Europe essentially. And it was here numerically that the majority of people who had not heard of Jesus lived and they were very poor. They were Muslims primarily, they were also Hindus and Buddhists. And so a call went out in the late 90s to go to the 1040 window. Again, even the language of it, the window of opportunity, right? So my, when I started to learn about this, I thought, well, I'm going to go with Western missionaries working within this window. Many of the missionaries who are, are work, many of the countries within the 1040 window are, it's illegal to proselytize as a Christian, and so many missionaries use what is called creative access, meaning they go to countries as maybe they run a loom company or they teach math or, you know, whatever gives them. They run a computer lab, there's some people in the book who run an aerobics studio. You know, you can find a variety of jobs to do. So I went to Iraq right before the war began to spend some time with the, the, the in the secular like magazine world, these guys are undercover missionaries. Now that's a pretty sexy sell. Undercover missionaries. So I went to spend some time with a woman named Janet who lives in Iraq, had lived there for more than a decade, uh, spreading the word, you know, and, and I would not share this story besides in talk about ethics. I mean, this is not off the record, but this is not something people need to particularly know about because I didn't write about her. But she she taught math by day, and by night she gathered with her friends and they would travel to the roof of uh, local you know, churches and pray that someday all the minarets of the mosques were replaced by crosses. Now, that's an incredibly dangerous thing to say that she did, A, and it's also extremely inflammatory, and also what she was doing was teaching math. And how many people had converted as a result of her work? Very, very few, if any. And in the book, it's with people who had not, who had not really had, yeah. So, okay, this is a long answer, but it's a big question. So after this trip with Janet, I decided that to publish work or to continue work in this vein was inflammatory at best, lethal at worst. And so, because it would put people's lives in danger for doing work that was primarily the mission work that went with the daily running of aid work. And it was wrong. And also, the story lay with Africans and Africans. Asians and Asians, not with a handful of Westerners who would misrepresent, by my choice of focusing on them, would misrepresent what the reality was on the ground. So that is what I had st started to do, and that's how ethically I changed what I was doing, because it just wasn't the right thing to do. Uh, Eliza, in the, in the book, uh, I would say maybe half of the stories relate to people who are uh, Islamic or people who are, are not Christian, let's just use some other religion. Um, you didn't have a chance to actually do reading from that section of the book, but there are just incredibly compelling stories, including conversations you had with people who had been terrorists, who had been responsible for many murders, and um, I, I have a sort of a two-part question. Um, you know, one is, can you tell us 
can, can you give the people who have not yet read the book sort of a, a flavor of some of uh, those encounters, some of the people you talked with, or pick one person, and then how did you manage to get in and meet with some of these people as a single white American uh, journalist? I don't know if you described yourself as a journalist or just a curious oh, yeah. visitor or, or what. Uh, so maybe someone to just say a few words about, although, you know, it, this gets to this question of ethics. There are so many people in the book who are doing incredible work toward peace. The person I'm going to talk about right now is not. His name is Farheen Ibn Ahmed. He went to an Al-Qaeda training camp in Afghanistan. And I was very interested in him because this is how global ideology goes local. He came back from this experience of fighting uh, in Afghanistan and really planted the seeds of violent jihad in a community in Indonesia. He literally taught Muslims how to fight against their Christian neighbors. And he had killed people in Afghanistan. He killed people in um, Sulawesi on this island. And he's part of a larger organization called Jama Islamia, which is linked to Al-Qaeda. Uh, so, okay, so I reached him through a journalist friend, and I traveled with him. I took him back to the island where he, I took him to the battlefield where he had start, taught people how to fight and kill. Um, and I was only able to do that because he has been imprisoned. And as a, as a result of that being imprisoned, he's also served as a police informant. So he's somewhat on the map of, um, he doesn't perceive himself, he thinks he's still part of the group. He is by name, um, but he is, he's moved away from violence because he has to, because the police are watching him. He's also been tortured beyond recognition. He says his brain works like a broken computer, electric shock. Uh, so it was difficult to, to to pull his story out of him, quite literally, because he couldn't follow too much information. Um, what he is symbolic of is that that chapter is called Beyond Jihad, because actually Indonesia, world's largest Muslim country, is moving beyond some of the constructs that we in the West are just beginning to encounter. Uh, and he is an example of the splintering and splintering and splintering within uh, violent fundamentalist groups, which is in Indonesia, weakening their power. Uh, not so elsewhere, but in Indonesia. Did you have a question, Mike? Well, uh, yeah, I'm tr trying to think of how to phrase this without seeming too naive. Uh, Joe and I and uh, Jeff were discussing your book uh, at, at coffee the other day. And I was saying how I had read it, which was I had read it, I'm an anthropologist, and I was reading this. This is really interesting descriptive stuff about these very di these kinds of places where I do research, so not among these particular people. And I was reading, well, look, this is all this really interesting stuff about religion, and, and, and I was reading it a little bit personally as what a, how, these, how religion was messing things up. And, <laughs> not being a particularly religious person myself. And, but what both Joan and Jeff said, and I wanted to ask you this, was is that they had read the book as really you're in, in some way wanting to bring out some of the good points about religion. And I wondered if you could comment about that a little bit. Sure, well I'm gonna <laughs> actually tell a momentary story that relates to that, which is, okay, to take liberal Protestantism to its extreme in the mission field, um, my parents, because of my dad's job, went to the Guarani people. They went to meet with, yeah, the, the people who were in the mission, right, the, that film. And, and my mother asked the local Episcopal missionaries, well, what are you doing with these people? What are you doing? What's your mission work like? And they said, we're supporting their indigenous religious experiences. And my mother said, well, and what are those? And the, the missionary said to her, we don't know. It's none of our business to ask. And that's kind of classic liberal Protestant mission today, right? So, you know, having grown up with that broad a tent definition of what spirituality is and how, you know, restoring nuance to the idea of mission work and restoring nuance to the idea of religious experience, because I grew up with it strongly, but in this larger secular culture, uh, that was really sort of at the heart of the project. While being, while being clear about where people, I mean, I started the book with the idea, does fundamentalism inherently lead to violence? Because 
it posits a binary division between us and them, right? There, if there's one way to reach heaven, then every other way is wrong. You're a sinner at best or you're evil at worst. So how does that idea of single-pointed salvation play out on the ground when different kinds of people meet? So that was, that was one of the ideas I kept chewing on. Well, I guess I'd, following up with that, I mean, one of the things that I kept thinking in your book is, is that with your stress on scarce resources and religion that, that you underplay the importance of politics. Because it hasn't always been the case that very evangelical Christians in this country were involved in politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a, a very much of a quietist, passive withdrawal from politics. I mean, the Southern Baptist Church I grew up in, if, if you set aside the issue of alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, we never heard anything about partisan politics. It wasn't regarded as appropriate. And so you, when you, when you, I mean, my theory is really is when you find people slaughtering people, it's not just scarce resources, it's not just religion, that there's some political... Sure. something political going on to set this off. This includes the partition of India, which, sure. you know, I mean, there was a, a sanction of it. And, you know, I keep thinking about uh, uh, the situation in Rwanda. Uh, my son spent a summer with a Quaker peacemaking team in Rwanda. Believe it or not, there are several thousand Quakers in, in Rwanda. And their, their, uh, their primary identity, according to him, was Quaker. Mm -hmm. You know, but we imposed Hutu and Tutsi or perhaps if we want to get really sophisticated, uh, Tutsi and moderate Hutu and, mm -hmm. you know, a moderate Hutu. But what, you know, it was politics that caused sure. that slaughter. Can you imagine how we would be interpreting that if it was on the 10th parallel and the Hutus had been Muslims and the sure. Tutsis Christians? Sure. I mean, Obama would probably be sending in drones to blow up whole households of people in the mountains, sure. uh, 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 you know, to wipe out the remnants of the Muslim thing. And, and uh, uh, so, it, 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 you know, it, it, there's nothing intrinsically... Uh, the, the, the dualism of evangelicalism doesn't historically lead directly to violence. It, it's, it's when it gets involved in certain kind of politics. You can see that in Nigeria and in Sudan. And, sure. you know, every, in fact, every, every single case you talked about, there's a very strong political incitement for these religious dimensions. Sure. So, yeah. and, and let's use the word instead of politics, let's just use power. Yeah. Because they're yeah. really, I mean, politics as we know it in terms of organized groups or sort of parties doesn't really exist, but power does. Um, and that it is a power wrestle underneath, you know, I mean, talking about the multifaceted aspects. Something else, of course, you know, the answer to does fundamentalism inherently lead to violence is no, it does not. We have both uh, tr historically in this country a withdrawal by those who the, those who called themselves, you know, who adhered to the fundamentals at first, withdrew from society. They were not about engaging in political change. They were about getting out of politics, getting out of that piece of the world. And so too, today, the most fundamentalist Muslims preach a withdrawal from contemporary society, and they preach an end to jihad. Why? Because there's no leader sanctioned today to make that declaration legitimately. So uh, there's a whole school, ooh, crazy Wahhabi Salafist seventh century guys want to return to the seventh century. Yeah, they do. And during the seventh century, there was a caliph. There was one leader who told them what to do. And since there's not today, they want to wear the same short pant pajamas, go back and follow strictly the Quran, and they don't want any more war. They don't want to touch politics at all. So again, looking closely at even these distinctions, these names we use, they just break down and down and down. That's a great point. Uh, toward the end of the book, you, you have a very interesting um, uh, description of some, some people who were forced off of their traditional lands. I think this is in Malaysia, if I'm not mistaken, or, or perhaps the Philippines. Um, the Orang Asli? The Orang Asli. Orang Asli. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. knew this. Anthropology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I wonder if you can talk about that just a little bit. It is a, it is a very right. touching, I think, uh, a story, a very sad story about these people who have been very marginalized. And uh, could, could you talk a bit about them? Sure. These are some of my favorite people in the book, and they're, they're called the Orang Asli. They are the last indigenous people on the Malay Peninsula. So they live in Malaysia. Uh, they are Samai, um, and they are, I mean, we would call them aborigines, a disputed term, indigenous people. You know, they go by a variety of names. 
they mostly live outside. They, they've historically lived on their own land, and many of them live in tree houses. Um, and so I spent some time in some of these tree houses with people because there's a struggle, and again, it has a huge political element because Malaysia, the Malay people, the Malaysian government, has less than 51%. They've got between 50 and 51% of the, of the power in their small country of 24 million people. They use Islam to shore up that power any way they can. And one of the things they want to do, basically because they want these people's land, they want these Orang Asli people's land, is they try to convert them to Islam. Because once they convert to Islam, they are Malay. They lose their indigenous identity, and the land that they live on can be bought and sold. It's no longer protected land for these indigenous people. So there's, a, and at the same time, there are Christian missionaries working among them. So there's this wrestle that anthropologists call the, the race to save the last lost souls. Okay, so I spent some time with, I went to a wedding, that the father. So Christianity functions there as it's one of these forms in which Christianity is a form of liberation and retention of identity because if you become a Christian, you still are indigenous. You don't have to give up your land. You're not Malay. You're not assimilated, essentially. And so I spent some time at a wedding with a furious father who was a Christian whose daughter was marrying a Muslim and because, by, by virtue of that marriage, she too would become a Muslim. He didn't know what she whispered to me in the beginning of the ceremony. She'd already converted. It was a mess. I mean, this wedding in this rubber glade, you know, we were supposed to, the, you're supposed to have a feast, but the father was so angry that we only had this chicken. I mean, it was just, it was just, I mean, the great gift of this book has been really wandering into people's homes and feeling that I had the right to be there because I had these questions that I felt were so important to ask. I want to ask you, I mean, you, yeah. in that section, you never, I mean, the, the, uh, your host who drove you in was an anthropology professor. And, and you know, the, 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 you, you repeated the defense of, of missionaries who reach indigenous tribes, which is, I mean, there's some amazing organizations. The Wycliffe Bible Translators is one of the most bizarre organizations on the face of the earth. 2,000 tongues to go, you know. And, uh, and, uh, but they, if you, if, if you criticize them for cultural genocide, they say, well, no, you know, we're actually preserving the, the uh, indigenous practices of these people against the oil companies and the governments and the Muslims. Uh, who make them, uh, who de-indigenize them. And you didn't really take a, a position on this. I mean, it's actually impossible to overestimate the angry tone with which anthropologists write about this. I mean, it is, it is there are whole books of the most ferocious invective directed against uh, uh, missionaries, mainly in the Amazon, is what I'm familiar yes, with, but in other ways. And, and, uh, and, no, not, not, not all anthropologists, but, some, but, I, did, but I was left thinking you thought there might be something to it uh, I because think, you were repeating the views of Christians and you well, never said anything about them. So uh, I am... You, I repeat what other people tell me. I do not weigh no. in myself. No. So there's something to it that in understanding what Christian identity means today in most of the world, uh, the idea of finding an identity that's a common, common thread and common spine, a common backbone against oppression is very true, right, for people themselves. So Julie Ito, the anthropologist who I was with, and man, did he say a lot of bad things about religion I didn't put in that book, so he didn't get in trouble with the Malaysian government. <laughs> but so, yes, there's very much the understanding. Yeah, there's no question that there, there's a lot of damage done by missionaries on both sides, Muslim missionaries and Christian missionaries. At the same time, for many of those who choose Christianity, who belong to minorities historically, they believe that this is a form of liberation. And that was my job, is to tell the story they, they believed, so. That's an interesting word you used. I've never heard that before, Muslim missionaries. I mean, oh yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah in, in Malaysia, these are government-sponsored guys who go into villages and are actually paid up to 3,000 US dollars to marry Orang Asli women. Because as I said, once, once that marriage happens, the, excuse me, <laughs> I think my little alarm is going off in case I was being lynched in here or something. I had a notifi notification going on. Um, so, so, what, so 
I'm going to just, can I yeah, hand you sure, that? Sure, sure. Okay. So, yes. So there's a financial incentive to marry Orangasli women for Muslim missionaries, and the reality is not about the marriage to the woman, it's about the kids. Because once those kids are born, they are born Muslims, and that thin Malay Muslim majority in the country is able to perpetuate itself through birth rates. So we're coming to the end of, of the time we have here today. I do encourage everybody to uh, pick up a book, and, and Eliza will also sign a copy for you at the end of the, of the session here. But um, I, could I just ask you to reflect a little bit? This seven years of your life, plus the writing of the book, uh, in the travels throughout this area, um, well, what comes next? Are you involved in another book? Are you continuing to research this topic or another? Well, right now, thank you for asking. <laughs> to have people curious about what I'm working on is a new phenomenon. <laughs> and not glazed over, you're still doing that thing in Africa? <laughs> so, um, uh, what I'm doing now, because I write poetry, and I was in Rome last year uh, with this amazing opportunity to write poetry, so I'm write, trying to finish a second book of poems, and I am also starting to write about poverty in America. Mm. And the relationship between our lack of investment in our own infrastructure and the poverty of the communities who depend on that infrastructure. Wonderful. Well, uh, I would like to say thank you to the people who've been with us today. First, uh, Eliza Griswold, then Michael Chibnick and Jeff Cox. Uh, I'm Joan Kerr. This is World Canvas Studio from International Programs. This program is also brought to you by Prairie Lights Books. Thank you, Jan, for making this possible. And University of Iowa TV has taped this program. It will be available uh, for viewing on UITV, and we'll be posting it on the Public Radio Exchange as well. Uh, so thank you all for coming. We're very happy to have you here. And uh, please give our, our guests here a uh, thank you. made these outrageous comments about our president being born a Muslim, I just got on the phone and said, what are you saying? That's politics. That's not religion. And you say you don't deal in politics. Oh, yes. And he does, to be very clear, his organization, Samaritan's Purse, and it has a medical arm, World Medical Missions, does some of the best, cleanest, and most cutting-edge missionary work and medical missionary work in the world. In most of the countries where I was, these are former British colonies, so most people, especially spoke religious English. leaders, spoke English. Mm -hmm. And it, it went not among the Orang Asli. I made this poor anthropologist translate for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What united them? Yeah. Well, to begin with African history, and I'm going to do this, this is going to be the last question because this takes long enough to answer, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. To begin with the reality that in 615 AD, when the Prophet Muhammad was preaching among his own people in the town of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, and his own people, the tribe, the Quraysh, didn't like this message of one single God, and they kicked him out. Uh, and he left with his followers, went about 210 miles away, went to a city then called Yathrib, now known as Medina, City of the Prophet. And he sent his most precious followers and his own daughter, Rukia, uh, to Africa. This, there wasn't even Islam yet. This is 615 AD. He sends them to the court of a Christian king, the king of Abyssinia. Uh, and, he, and why? Because he believes that this Understanding of one shared God is more powerful than any connection of blood and tribe. How, and this is one of the earliest cases of political asylum in history. And Muhammad's followers went to the king and they said, we're going to tell you a story. They recited chapter 8 of the Quran, which is the chapter of the Virgin Mary giving birth to Jesus. And the Christian king was so moved by that 
and so overwhelmed that these two religions, this nascent faith of Islam, shared so much with his understanding of Christianity that he gave these people land. He gave Muhammad's followers land in a place called Nagash. It's still there today. Their descendants live there, and I was there a few months ago. So the shared history of these religions is older nowhere than in Africa, and it is insanely, it's insanely important to understand this context of cooperation and coexistence that predates some of the current political and power struggles we're watching now. Thank